I'm uh, uh, I'm op I'm, I'm back here, waiting, ready for for questions. Um, but just while people are thinking through what they might have to to ask, uh, um, I thought that I would. Oh, there's Peter. Hi, Peter. Um, yeah, um, please share your your questions. Um, Carrie, thank you very much for um, for coming to join us and also for sharing the film directly from your computer. Um, I think uh, while people are preparing their questions, do you have anything that you'd want us to make sure we took away from the film? Ooh, I never quite know um, how to answer that question, you know, because like everybody comes to it with a different, um, from a different place. Sometimes people are coming to it from, uh, from a position of, of learning. Um, some people have have this experience in their families. And so I'm always really cognizant of that when I'm, when I'm trying to answer that kind of a question. Um, but I guess maybe that's, that's one way of answering it, that I hope that, that for, for whatever reason, people came to watch it. Um, they were able to, to, as I said, when I was about to start the film, uh, watch with a tender heart. Um, and to be able to bring a little bit of themselves and their own experience into, into this film and what it, and what it's about and I guess what it represents for this country. Thank you. Um, that was a very good answer to a very difficult question. Uh, so I have, um, two questions that came up during the, uh, film. One, uh, was, more of a comment, uh, Su Lin wanted to let you know that this was a powerful film and that they're grateful that they're going to have the opportunity to see your work when it's shown in Campbell River. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm so happy that the, that the replica has been touring the island. It's nice, um, especially for it to be going uh, further north than it's been in the past and getting close to the Kokwakiwak territory that my people come from originally. Second question I have is, uh, I just want to give you formal permission to dodge this one if you want to, um, was just mentioning it was Marilyn had noticed, uh, had, uh, who I, Marilyn, who identifies as a retired teacher, wanted to say that, that you did the right thing in resigning from the school district 61 school board uh, and that she's sending you healing and positive energy. Um, and she wanted to know how you were doing after that experience. Uh, I have, thank you for that. We're, we're crossing over into, into politics, deeper into politics, I guess, maybe, and, and local politics at that. Uh, I'm doing quite well. Thank you, Marilyn. And I felt incredibly well supported by so many members of this community um, in Victoria, from the Indigenous community. And, and I'm really hopeful that, that these these conversations that came up from that lead to uh, lead to some fundamental changes. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing signs of that. And maybe, maybe one of the, the most rewarding parts of it is being able to take part in conversations between the four houses, the Lekwungen nations, the Métis and the, um, the indigenous population that is not on reserve here in Victoria uh, and seeing how they've come together um, in sort of united to, to expect and demand change. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Heather uh, who identifies as a settler who attended public school in the 60s and 70s. Um, she said that she has saw many Indigenous students who were horribly treated within the public school system, as well as uh, in the indoctrination of settler children into systematic racism. Um, she is asking if you think this additional layer of abuse will ever be acknowledged. Um, I, I think that it is being acknowledged. I think that that's part of what the last question 
was about around the systemic racism that exists and persists in so many of the different um, structures that we have, whether it's the education system, the healthcare system, um, our, our justice system. Um, these, these ways were not designed by or for um, IBPOC people. Um, in most cases, they were not designed for or by women. And there's therefore a lot of inequity built into them. And that's a lot of the work that I'm doing now with my, um, with my position at the University of Victoria, with my artwork. And it's to try to, I guess, in my pursuit of reconciliation, and my search for the root causes of the need for reconciliation, I've seen a lot of overlap between the various kinds of injustices that we face collectively. And they trace, in my mind, back to um, a colonial mindset. They trace back to uh, a system, an economic system, uh, that's not designed for all of us to participate in. It's, it's um, this idea of exponential growth. It, it, it affects all of us in different ways, whether that's people being um, turned into resource or land being turned into resource. We end up with, uh, with the top of the economic pyramid benefiting from land air, water, people, and in a very inequitable way. So that's what my work has been and continues to be about. And I think that well, we need to confront colonialism. We need to try to reimagine capitalism. Um, and we have to question the way that we measure the things that we take for granted. When we say, you know, we have to do this because of the economy. Yes, the economy is critical because we have to have, it has to continue to, for us to be able to feed people, to provide healthcare, for all of those things to happen. But I don't believe that the economy needs to grow year and quarter after quarter because it should be tied to the number of people and to the need not to profit. I know I kind of wandered off there, but it's, it's, it all lines up in that. Um, for me, they, they, these things start to overlap. Well, I found, I found that eloquently stated, uh, but I mean, you have the microphone, you can say, you can take the questions wherever you want to take them. Um, we have a question about how does the idea of bearing witness play in the healing process in your mind? That's a great question. Um, Again, it's a this may be a multi-tiered answer um, because it depends on the perspective you're coming from. I think that bearing witness for me, um, in in the way that I define that term, the way that we use it in Kokwaki Walk ceremony, is not simply a passive um, listen and learn and be quiet. It's uh, it's more active than that. When, when we called witnesses for the, um, for the ceremony where we put the witness blanket into the shared stewardship with the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, which happened in Comox a couple of years back, though the witnesses there have a role and that role is to tell the story of the commitments that were made and to hold me and the museum accountable to those commitments. Um, when you play that out in, in a wider issue like reconciliation, then that means part listening, part doing, um, part holding others accountable, um, part inward looking and and holding yourself accountable. Uh, when it comes to the healing part of that, uh, if we're talking uh, like a societal rift, 
um, that is built into that accountability is relationship, right? That's uh, the, the rebuilding of relationship, good relationship between different people. Um, that's a pretty critical part of, of healing. Uh, and, and for me, that's about healing all of the trauma and, and taking, taking stock of, acknowledging um, all of the harms of colonialism. And residential schools are part of that. But we, we continue with it today um, in multiple different ways. So I think as a witness, you can start to piece those um, different parts of the puzzle together and and ask for better ask for things to be different and be prepared for uh to be to participate in change but also like there's a real hesitancy because so often we feel like change is risky because it's unfamiliar and i would counter that by saying that staying the same is not getting us any further forward and that maybe we've been conditioned to be afraid of change when change can be uh, transformational in a great way. Um, thank you. Uh, I have uh, Su Lin and Rosie both have just uh, comments uh, praising the film. Um, Su Lin says, so moving, crying at his beautiful audio, strong, true words, and loved the music. Uh, Rosie noted that she loved the pace, the pauses, the making of documentary, and the goosebumps she got when your wife initially spoke. Uh -huh. uh, and just, they both are saying thank you. Thank you to both. When when Elaine wrote and recorded that, uh, that intro, I was, uh, and I still am, moved. I sometimes have to... I, I never know which part of the film is going to get me again. <laughs> um, sometimes it's there. Um, sometimes it's the ceremony with my sisters. Um, other times it's when I'm when we're when we all went to my dad's residential school and he sort of just the memories of that day are kind of those things that clutch at me. But um, yeah. And, there's so many parts of this film that are so deeply personal, uh, but also hopefully uh, speak to the universal nature of the experience. I, I personally think that the the relatability, like the 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 huge amount of yourself that you've shared through the film, um, makes it a lot easier to grasp the deeper issues that um, you're talking about. Um, speaking only for myself. Um, yeah, I just I I actually find I I tear up multiple times. This is the second time I've had the chance to walk through it, and I tear up with it. And I it's just it's beautiful. Um, Jay had said that uh, they had no idea how many people, uh, friends, family, and so many others were involved in putting the exhibit together, and that uh, they were deeply moved by your sister's donating of their hair. Um, was offering their hair a surprise to you, and how did it make you feel when you saw it happen? Um, it, it wasn't a surprise. It was planned pretty early on. Um, and it was a response to one of the few stories that we heard about my dad, about our dad. And he, because that was like, he told us a few things. One of them was that he didn't eat, um, rice pudding or scalloped potatoes because he ate them constantly at residential school. And the other one was that he had his hair shaved the day he arrived. Um, so that was that was kind of their way of honoring him. And as soon as the project was a go, they started to grow their hair with the purpose of cutting it in ceremony and putting their braids on the blanket. Um, even with you know, like a, a full year, year and a half of uh, preparation and knowing that that was gonna happen because it was one of the last sort of acts that we did together before I started building the blanket. Um, knowing that it was coming and being fully prepared for it, it was incredibly emotional. I think that that scene 
where where we're going through the ceremony and we just stopped talking and it was mostly just a crackle of the fire uh that says so much about what it felt like for me to to stand and have them place those braids into my hands um and and just the the weight and realization of everything that was wrapped up in that that it was it was a year and a half commitment then that eight days of ceremony and the change of their own identity and image and that's on top of our father's experience and all of the other students who had that same experience and so there's you know like sometimes everything in life comes to like a a focal point and when they handed me those braids that was one of them where the the overwhelming weight and complexity of of what they symbolize came like fully into focus during that ceremony um and i was just so so filled with uh, a sense of pride and feeling deeply um, honored um, and humble that that I was being tasked with this responsibility. Um, Anita had some questions about one of your other projects. Um, uh, she says that she felt connected with your spirit pull project, uh, cel uh, ironically celebrating the colonialism of BC 150. Uh, any thoughts on how we salvage what's good from those events and move forward without settler shame? Uh, that's the great question of of how do you do how do you do uh, do reconciliation in a way that that's for everyone um, and where we come out on the other side of it feeling um you know feeling on equal ground i think that there's there's some some of the challenges uh around letting go of control for um uh, for in, in the relationship and the these big questions about land and resource um and and governance and all those things uh, are around fear uh that that maybe indigenous people will will uh, do things similarly to um, to others as have been done to us. Um, how to salvage, I think that uh, maybe the best answer for this question is to look at the way that we collectively respond to things. Um, not in practice, not when, not once a government is elected and then they start counting dollars and cents and votes, but in the aspiration and inspiration that goes into the process of being coming elected and the things that we as a society respond to, those are positive things for the most part. And then we get down into breaking issues up and dividing them based on some sort of set of priorities that changes from one individual to the next um, and and unfortunately ranking them into a hierarchy and then even though something might remain important to you you still have to consider your own self um, but in there is is i think who we are collectively that by and large, people in this country, people in this province, people on this island um, are in favor of a better relationship. And although sometimes we get uh, entrenched about different issues, about statues, about the way that we talk about our history, um, for the most part, we want the same thing. And I've had some interesting conversations lately um, with a gentleman 
who, who put it to me like this. He said, in his work, he likes to focus, he likes to talk about dreams rather than visions. Because when you talk about dreams, everybody can agree for the most part on what we want to have. When you start talking about visions, you're talking about the process by which we get there. And that's where the divisions between us start to surface and things break down and we don't get all the way there. Um, if you think of it on a scale, then there's this portion of the population who are fully committed to and ready for reconciliation and they understand what that means and um, where they sit in it. Then there's this big population in the middle that don't necessarily um, think about it all that often, right? But those are the ones that vote for and are in favor of, you know, positive social change. And then there's a small subset on the other end of the spectrum that are pretty committed to, to, to more destructive ways of thinking, to, to racist ideal, ideology, um, to patriarchal thinking. Um, and we have all those people in the middle to, to work with. And that's where, where change happens or doesn't. Um, so I, I don't think that I have a simple answer um, to any of this question, but I do have a lot of hope. And lastly, I will say that my work with children, whether it's carving a totem with them or talking about residential schools with them has, uh, is, is another huge source of hope for me personally, because they process this information, um, on basic lines of fairness. And when they see things that aren't fair, that's, they call it as it is. Um, this is another one that might be so broad as uh, giving you an open opportunity to dodge it. Uh, is there a website you can suggest where one could learn more about reconciliation and decolonization uh, to see how far we've come and to see how, how much we can learn? I know that's a gigantic question, so. I'm still trying to learn about reconciliation and decolonization. So I don't know if there's one singular authoritative source. I've heard really good things about the open and free course that's run by, I think, the University of Calgary. Um, is, that, is that correct? I think it's the University of Alberta. It's University the, of the, the uh, I think, Indigenous Canada or something along those lines. Yeah, that's that's the the, the one I'm I'm thinking of, and it's a, apparently it's a really incredible resource, and and I might suggest that. Um, I would also suggest taking a look at the NCTR website. They have a, an incredible amount of information there about residential school history. Um, when it comes to to decolonization, give me a couple of years. <laughs> I'm working on establishing a center or what I'm calling the Uncenter for Arts and Decolonization at the University of Victoria. Uh, and, and I think that what decolonization for me means is, is really uh, re rethinking the systems, right? Um, rethinking the ways in which systemic issues are perpetuated in the day-to-day -day choices that we each make um, and figuring out my own way through that and how I can become um, less of a contributor to it. Um, thank you. Uh, Margaret asks, uh, she says, I see truth and reconciliation as perhaps one of the most significant challenges Canadians of all origins must find a way to navigate. My gratitude, my gratitude for embarking on this important uh, project in the accompanying film uh, to Carrie and all who contributed. Uh, what do you imagine is a meaningful starting point for us to begin our long journey of informing ourselves of our true history and contributing to the healing reconciliation process on a personal community level? Um, and I feel like you've partially answered that with your previous answer. Yeah. I, I, a few things. 
Well, one of the things I think is critical, um, and it's where I focus a lot of my attention, is on the way that we think about our collective relationship with land. Um, it connects to um, cl climate change. It connects to uh, us running, almost running out of old growth uh, ecosystems. Um, it connects to the health of our oceans and our rivers and our lakes, and the air we breathe. Um, because we so often think of land as property, we think of land as resource, and we don't think of it as being part of who we are. And that not only our own survival, but the survival of our children and our children's children is dependent on the way that we treat the lands that give us life. Um, in Kwakwala, we have a word for this. It's, and the word is awitnakyola. And it means to live in good relations with the land, air, water, spirit world, and everything in them. And I guess what I think of that as is that we are no greater or less than the animals and the plants and the water. Um, but we have a long history, or at least a hundred and a couple hundred years of history of in, particularly through industrialization of separating and placing ourselves above, um, dividing up these lands into postage stamp pieces of property that people claim and put fences up around, which is all fine. I don't have an issue with needing space, but when that becomes um, an entitlement that where the thing that we want outweighs what everybody else needs, um, then I think that's a problem. And I think that that, that ties back into that sort of um, divergence I went into about, about the way that capitalism functions. So um, to tie it up, transforming our relationship with land um, and acknowledging that we should be here as stewards and that we should look at the resources that we have under our feet as uh, not only ours, but also belonging to those who are yet to come. And therefore we should only take what we need in the moment. Um, and for me, that doesn't include copious amounts of exponential profit. Um, we have a, a comment from Cheryl, uh, who just wanted to let you know that uh, she's so pleased with what you do and what you've done uh, and who you are. Uh, as a uh, Kwa Kwa Kwaok, uh, I helped change. Uh, she says that she's helped change the perspective of teachers, and now now have the honor of helping in the hospital, uh, and that uh, she believes in all to appreciate the different perspectives, so that we can also understand the settlers. Uh, blessings to all who share our world. Yum. Yeah. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, There's lots and lots of work to do, isn't there? <laughs> Uh, Tina wanted to thank you for sharing the film uh, so that we could see the amazing personal journeys that went to the creation of the witness blanket uh, and says that it speaks to how art can give the artist and audience so much healing and understanding about the world. Thank you, Tina. I, I really think that art has all arts, not just, you know, like sculpture and painting, but performance arts and the written word and music. Uh, dance they have an incredible transform formative power um and that's uh, something i don't know if we if we believe enough in in this country um i see it when i go to to ironically the the birthplace of a lot of the colonialism <laughs> that spread out around the world but uh but a real commitment to arts in in, in europe and and although we have a lot of supporters for it here, I don't think that we support see the collectively putting parameters around what it can or should or should be. Um, so this is just my little plug for um, supporting all forms of the arts because 
they're critical for for us because they become a reflection of the things that we want to see for for ourselves and for each other. Um, Margaret wanted to note that the uh, scene of ceremony surrounding your sister's donation of the hair in the context of knowing how deeply violated the children of residential schools were upon the arrival broke her. Uh, it's as though she could feel the sorrow of thousands coming through the screen in waves. Uh, the connection was palpable uh, and the cruelty was as well. Um, she's heartened by the spirit of so many in the film who, although having survived such an immense dishonor, express a softness and a forgiveness for their perpetrators. It's one of the most powerful and gracious things that I encountered in making this project was how incredibly generous survivors were are um, in what they share um, and how they share it and what their expectations of each of us are as witnesses, as uh, allies. And if I ever need um, reminding or if I ever need to be reinvigorated in this work, that's who I turn to because I think about my father and the, the work he did as a school teacher um, and to, to help raise me and my sisters. And all the while um, making decisions that were based on his experiences, which is one of the reasons that we were as a family homeschooled. But just thinking about, you know, that, that weight that people carry and how, for the most part, they do it with such a beautiful way. Um, and it's a model for me and probably for anyone. I think that there, there are very few things I can see that I would hope I could aspire to more than the, the level of I, the, the forgiveness uh, from the people, especially the ones you talked to in the film. It's, I, I can't, um, it's just so much uh, and such an amazing thing to see the capacity that they have for, for forgiving unforgivable things. Um, Donna uh, wanted to thank you for the incredible project and for documenting the process and the conversations, um, the stories of the soul of the blanket. And it's so impactful to learn of them. Thank you to all uh, you and all the team. Thank you, Donna. I got a funny message from somebody who appeared in the film, um, Merrick Tyler. He, uh, just as we were starting the film today, he wrote me a message saying, are you in Nanaimo? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm sitting in my kitchen. Um, anyways, he's in Nanaimo and he was gonna try and like burst in on, um, on the Q&A and surprise me. Um, but he's one of the one of those team members. Um, he and Rosie on the collection side of things, Colin on the building side of things, my whole family, and all of the folks who helped put it together. Um, yeah, I'm continually grateful. It's been over over eight. Or was it? Yeah around eight years since this project started and i still don't think that i could do it again um because so many things had to come together so many people had to put their their time and effort in to make it possible uh, and so many of the buildings just aren't there anymore so yeah i'm i'm also incredibly grateful to that team You're, you're muted this time, Peter. My apologies. Um, the, the final comment that uh, I, I think we have is um, to thank you for sharing the film so we could see the amazing personal journeys that went to the creation of the witness blanket. It speaks to how art can give the artist and the audience so much healing and understanding about the world. Um, thank you to whoever sent that. Um, thank you, Peter, for putting in um, putting these questions into or voicing these questions for everybody um, and to Jason and Emma and April who've 
help put this together today. Um, and thanks to everyone out there who's been, been who's watched this and who's who's given us your your questions. Um, I'm I'm very very grateful to have had this opportunity, Gail Kessler. Um, I've been given two um, two things I'm supposed to plug after this, but um, Carrie, do you have anything that you want to make sure people know about uh, that you're doing right now that you'd want them to pay attention to? I'll give a quick rundown. Um, with the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, we are working on uh, a project we're calling the Digital Witness Market. That um, project is an extension of this documentary. It takes up and tells the stories of um, residential school survivor experience through the words of survivors. And it's partially um, based on the format that uh, of the book that Kirsty Hudson and I wrote together called uh, Picking Up the Pieces, Residential School Memories and the Making of the Witness Blanket. We are also, I'm also working with Camosun Commotion Innovates on a VR version of the blanket, um, which we're building a, a soundscape. I'm building a soundscape with, um, with my friend and colleague Kirk at the University of Victoria to bring sound in as memory to help to connect people to that project, to a virtual project in the way that the, the objects on the blanket might. Um, and then this legacy of the witness blanket, which is the uncenter I mentioned, the uncenter for arts and decolonization. Uh, I think that that might be more critical than the witness blanket itself because it will provide more time and space and resources for other artists to take on social issues uh, with their work. Uh, and lastly, my new, my newest project, which I'm embarking on with the University of Victoria and with the National Film Board is called The Seedling. And it is where I am designing a totem in 3D software. We are planting a small grove of Western red cedar trees and the university is committing to making and raising the totem when the tree is mature. Um, so that's, one of those like super big long timelines that brings up all kinds of really fascinating and wonderful questions about how do we change the way we think about these lands? How do we change the way that we plan um, for our futures? And it's sort of um, my, I, I guess my next, my next big art project. So there you go. That is, that just, that is an incredible project. <laughs> Just for uh, unrelated to that, uh, one of the things that I've been asked to mention is the um, uh, Shaw Spotlight is going to be airing uh, a special on the Witness Blanket on September 16th at 7 p.m. Uh, if it's on the Shaw Cable, if you have the Shaw Cable TV ser service, you'll find the story playing in the Shaw Spotlight Features Vancouver Island on Shaw Basic Cable Channel 4 and Shaw Blue Curve TV Channel 105. Uh, there are some specific air times as well uh, on in Nanaimo and Parksville, which includes Salt Air, Ladysmith, Gabriel Island, Protection Island, Lanceville, Nanoose, Qualicum Beach, and Bowser. It will be showing on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday at 3 a.m. and 3 p.m. Um, to be honest, rather than reading all the way through this, uh, Jason, is there a place we can put this where we can direct people to, just so that I don't have to make them note down the times that it might be there? Uh, if so, could you throw it in the chat? Amazing. <laughs> so Shaw TV Spotlight, if there's Shaw stuff, there's somewhere where you can wind up seeing some interviews about the witness blanket, that'll be pretty powerful. Um, Carrie, I, I cannot uh, thank you for showing up. Uh, I'm, we are extremely grateful for you sharing so much of yourself in this. And um, it just is an absolute, uh, it is an absolute pleasure to meet you in person or as close to in person as we can get to these days. Thank you, Peter. It's great to meet you as well. Um, 
I just want to finish by saying that I, I pretty much grew up in the soup branch of the library. Um, my mom worked there pretty much my entire childhood. I would go there for math tutoring and to sit around and read books. Um, and so I'm incredibly grateful for the work that, um, that this, the regional library system has done throughout, uh, throughout this island. So once again, thank you for inviting me to be here and thanks for organizing this. Um, as reluctant as I am to take the last word, I think I have to close us off. Um, so thank you for everyone who showed up. Thank you to Carrie. And um, please uh, feel, uh, I think we put some links to the video in the in the um, box for as long as it's available for people to see. I strongly recommend sharing it as widely as you can. Bye everybody. Enjoy the long weekend.